is Marinos Papayogin, and I am the director of Royal Commonwealth Society Cyprus. Welcome to another episode of the new video podcast series of RCS Cyprus titled Meet the Royal Commonwealth Society and the Commonwealth. In this special episode, we're discussing about a very important institution related with the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council, which is a business network of Commonwealth with, all, with over 90 business and government strategic partners from 27 countries and territories. Particularly, we will examine the future challenges and opportunities of this institution, and also we will discuss the current situation as was formed by COVID-19. In order to discuss about the Council, today we are hosting two very distinguished guests, Lord Marla, Chairman of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council, and Mr. Kosas Katsaros, Member of the Global Advisory Board of the Council. Allow me briefly introduce our special guest. Lord Marla is retired as the Prime Minister, Trade Envoy, and Chairman of the Business Ambassador Network in 2014. He's also the former Chairman of the Commonwealth Business Council and was Minister for the Department of Energy and Climate Change in 2010 and Minister for the Department of Business, Innovation and Skill. Lord Marlan was also a founding director of various multinational insurance companies. Mr. Kostas Katsaros is a founding partner in Emilianidis Katsaros Associates Law Firm and a practicing lawyer in Cyprus, advises some of the biggest organizations of the island with a portfolio of international clients that operate in Cyprus and abroad. Mr. Katsaros has significant administrative experience as he served as the chairman of the board, one of the biggest media groups in Cyprus, a senior independent member of the board of the financial institution of Cyprus, and chairman of the board, one of the biggest insurance companies in the island. He also serves as a board member of the Cypriot Italian Business Association Synthesis, which has been recognized as the Italian Cypriot Chamber of Commerce by the Italian government in December 2019. Dear gentlemen, it's a great honor to have you, and let me thank you for accepting my invitation, and let me welcome you to the RCS Cyprus Video Podcast Series. Thank you, Marianos. Very good to be here. I'm very, you know, I have a picture of Cyprus in my mind. Um, sadly, I'm not with you. Uh, it was actually going to be my last uh, official visit was to Cyprus before COVID forbade me from joining you, but... Um, uh, I'm with you in spirit, and I hope to be with you in body um, in, later in the year. Uh, I'm delighted to see that on that point, by the way, the Prime Minister has lifted uh, his quarantine of British subjects uh, coming back from Cyprus on holidays by creating this air bridge, which is in response to a letter that I wrote to him, uh, two letters actually, um, inviting him to consider the, the, uh, how brilliantly uh, countries like Cyprus and many of the Commonwealth small islands had responded to the virus, how few fatalities that you had had, and that actually um, Britain and the Commonwealth were, uh, particularly as the UK a chair in office, um, are, are incredibly closely linked and that uh, the UK should show leadership in uh, opening uh, these, um, this, uh, um, this air bridge. Um, and so this is extremely good news. And uh, number 10 Downing Street told me on Friday they, was, they were going to announce it today. And I'm glad to see they have. Well, so we're going to have you. Uh, oh. Thank you. Hopefully, hopefully, uh, air uh, bridge is created soon. Uh, we need touring in Cyprus uh, from uh, the previous years when uh, uh, there were record, uh, records uh, of uh, tourism coming here in the island. Uh, last year we had almost 5 million. Uh, unfortunately, we are not expecting more than 1 million this year. Uh, however, even this one million is uh, important for the for the local economy, and uh, we are uh, really depending on uh, British tourism as it has been a pillar of the touristic sector here in the island. So, let's hope that the situation clears out and uh, uh, things get back to normal gradually. Yeah. 
So uh, allow me to um, begin the discussion um, about the, mainly about the, the council. So Lord Marlan, um, allow me to begin in with you by asking you um, the main priorities and the main activities of the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council. Well, thank you very much, Marios. Um, we started the council six years ago, uh, nearly six years ago, and our intention really was to build a Commonwealth network. The Commonwealth name is still a trusted and recognized brand, uh, brand name, for want of a better word, throughout um, 53 countries. The, uh, and of course, dependencies, so roughly 60, 65 uh, countries. Uh, but it has been a ne neglected um, name in many ways. And people haven't realized the potency of it. And having been uh, the Prime Minister's trade envoy, which you kindly mentioned earlier, um, and traveled, I think I did something like 32 countries in 18 months, or country visits in 18 months, I realized that this was a neglected but potent uh, and potentially huge um, groupings of people, a third of the world's population, all of them speaking English, uh, underpinned largely as uh, hopefully Costas will not disagree by the British rule of law, orig origins of the British rule of law, uh, obviously democ democratic countries and uh, sharing so many um, interests. I mean, uh, Costas mentioned the huge amount of British people and Commonwealth people who go to Cyprus um, uh, that uh, obviously it has been used as a military base. Um, and so, you know, there's been steep, deep relationships uh, between Cyprus, of course, but that applies to virtually every Commonwealth country. Uh, we share similar loves of sport, of, um, uh, of, uh, of culture, and, and of course of education. I know, I mean, there are so many wonderful Cypriots uh, in London. There are so many wonderful British people living in Cyprus. Um, and uh, there's this great exchange, which you can't really put your finger on, um, but there are so many ingredients that it makes this wonderful cake called the Commonwealth. But it has been neglected. So uh, we set about trying to establish a go-to business um, connection for people in the Commonwealth to build a network and through that network um, create obviously trade but also um, to be able to help influence governments on their thinking in return in, in terms of trade and business um, and um, so that was our initial priority and I think it's fair to say it's exceeded, way exceeded uh, what we anticipated. Our initial business plan suggested we might have 50 members uh, by this time. Uh, we're double that. Uh, I hadn't thought that we'd have um, seven or eight offices throughout the Commonwealth, which we now have, or hubs as we call them, uh, that we would be in a financially stable position even though we're a not-for-profit organization. We're a commercial not-for-profit organization, but uh, I was, our ambition was to ensure that if uh, events got outside our control and we've just had one or are in the process of one, that we could um, survive and continue to offer support to our members during it. And indeed, uh, we have. We haven't laid off any staff. We've um, maintained um, our activity. In fact, uh, some would say even greater activity. Um, and uh, we've had a great many successes. Thank you very much, um, I mean, for your answer. Uh, now, uh, my question is, if, if you could mention the, the biggest achievement of this business, Network uh, the last uh, six years. Well, well, I, I I don't wish to be immodest because obviously we've had elements of failures, but I, I think some of the, as I said a moment ago, uh, we've now got an office in Kuala Lumpur, 
Gibraltar, Malta, Cayman, Nigeria, Ghana, uh, City of London. Obviously, we have one in the West End of London, um, to name but a few. Uh, and th this is a great achievement because it's, it's broadened our network. We've failed, by the way, to have real traction in places like um, Canada, uh, a number of the Caribbean islands. Uh, we haven't done, haven't had yet any success in the Pacific Islands, but we've got, um, as of last week, serious inquiry of membership from Fiji and Tonga. We've got members from Australia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Nigeria, Ghana, Cameroon, Kenya, Uganda, South Africa, um, Malta, obviously, UK, Cayman, Turks and Caicos, Canada, Malay Malaysia, Singapore, and the wonderful Cyprus, um, to name most of the countries. So we've, uh, you know, we, we, we've made great inroads with uh, many of those countries, but uh, have indeed uh, not touched all of them, uh, which is our ambition. Um, some of the successes has been, as I mentioned to you earlier, uh, inviting the Prime Minister re to reconsider his, um, his quarantine of um, 14 days of British citizens um, visiting the Commonwealth Island states who are heavily dependent upon um, tourism. I think that um, a program we started called Commonwealth First, which helps SMEs export into the Commonwealth, uh, which clearly we're not doing at the moment, uh, has been extremely successful and is a valuable program. I think the um, two business forums that we've organized uh, in, in, in line with Chogham, which was Malta, of course, and the UK, and sadly, um, as of last week, we were meant to be in Rwanda, but uh, for obvious reasons, are not. Yeah. Um, but we would have had a great program there. And I think the program of activity we've had since um, lockdown has been uh, extremely valuable and indeed will continue to be so uh, as we um, have David Cameron doing a webinar with us tomorrow. Um, or is it, yes, it is, to, uh, uh, yes, tomorrow, and um, have Gordon Brown, and we, we're, we're, we've had very positive reception from Kenya, and the Premier of Ken Prime Minister of Kenya, and the Prime Minister of South Africa. So, you know, we, we've got, uh, we've had a lot of activity. I think the work we're doing on uh, ensuring that vaccines are shared across the Commonwealth when they're released, not just with one Commonwealth country. And as I said, um, to be financially viable and to be able to keep the team together through a, a crisis and keep my dynamic team, and they're a brilliantly dynamic team and just work all hours, God sends, luckily, uh, together is brilliant. And um, I think that the, the proof is in the pudding. We've lost uh, inevitably a few members as they have had financial crises. But uh, we have gained members in the last um, few months. And um, we uh, are almost in the same net position that we were before the crisis. So I think that's been uh, fantastic for us and very uplifting. And, and you know, I, I want to reiterate again how grateful we are for the support of our friends in Cyprus and our members there and, and our ambition if you moving on from you know our success and failures uh, our ambition is to um, be in every country in some shape or form our ambition is to have a broader membership but not hugely greater because we want to be able to manage and respond to the uh, demands of our members uh, but to have in each country a sort of vibrant hub that um, recognizes the benefits that our organization brings. And as I can't thank people like Costas enough for their support, and I can't uh, applaud more the, the work that you're doing with the Royal Commonwealth Society in, in promoting the Commonwealth name. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, 
I think with your comments, uh, we can go to the uh, to, to my second question to, to Mr. Katsaros uh, about the opportunities uh, and the benefits for the participants in this network. In other words, what is the incentive for, for participation um, in the council? Uh, first of all, uh, Lord Marlon, thank you for your, uh, for your uh, nice words. I think you are exaggerating a bit. We haven't managed to succeed a lot uh, from Cyprus. There are a lot of uh, opportunities for an expansion here. I think that getting the vibes of, uh, of a broader network, uh, I would say uh, imagine a role of a chamber, a multinational uh, business forum uh, with access to more than 50 countries of the Commonwealth. So um, this by itself is a big opportunity. Uh, there are not many chances that you would, uh, an, an enterprise would have the chance to be in contact and in close contact, I would say, uh, with institutional members of both the private and the public sector. Uh, don't forget that uh, members of SWEG are not only enterprises, but also governments of Commonwealth countries. So uh, we have also institutional partners. So uh, there are, uh, there is, uh, I mean, by definition, the opportunity to have a global reach through uh, your presence as a member in such a body. Uh, we have seen the activities that are taking place throughout the last years. There are regular advisory board meetings uh, where uh, uh, new members are welcomed and there is also uh, uh, feedback for the activities of the, of the Council during the previous months. Uh, there are also various, um, uh, now with the, the COVID crisis, there are a lot of web forums that are taking place, a lot of information uh, that is being exchanged between the members. We have the chance to follow up um, from uh, feedback of members that, for example, are analyzing the effects of uh, the situation at, at all fronts, uh, especially for Cyprus. I would say that you know, we have a very big opportunity here because uh, due to Brexit, uh, it's, it's um, inevitable that the uh, UK will, will uh, try to revive uh, bonds with um, countries abroad and Commonwealth is a network by itself. It's a, it's a, a union of countries that will have, uh, that, that uh, will have its own, let's say, expansion throughout the years to come because it, it is a, a channel of communication for trade, for business, uh, alternative uh, of the EU. So this, having this in mind, uh, we can see the broader picture and the opportunities that may arise for a country like Cyprus, which is, as Lord Marland said, a country with strong bonds uh, and close bonds with uh, uh, the British culture and the Commonwealth culture. It, it, uh, uh, its contract law is an identical copy of Indian contract law. There are uh, all the norms and the uh, customs of uh, common law. Uh, we have the same, let's say, business language and uh, the enterprise world is uh, oriented by the norms of the common law. So uh, having this combination in place, there are not many countries in the EU. It's only Malta and Cyprus, I would say. Ireland is a difficult, uh, is, is another uh, uh, case. So only Malta, Malta and Cyprus have these uh, benefits, uh, I would uh, dare to say. So it's an opportunity for companies here in Cyprus to uh, to see the dynamics of, uh, of this, this uh, uh, forum. And I would say that the target for the next years would be to enhance uh, the presence of uh, the Commonwealth countries, uh, uh, the Commonwealth Council in Cyprus, uh, and trying to persuade that there is a lot of room for doing business here and create maybe a business hub as the ones that are existing elsewhere. Since Cyprus is a, is a, is a hub by itself, I mean, 
yeah. in an area of the world where, you know, uh, there is the Middle East, there is uh, Africa, uh, Southeastern Europe, a lot of geopolitical uh, reforms are taking place in the Eastern Mediterranean right now. So it's, it's really an important, uh, small, but um, strategically placed uh, small country, uh, which could have an important, let's say, meaning for the, for the Council and the Commonwealth world. Uh, at least that's my opinion. So uh, we can see, apart from the tangible benefits of uh, being a member in, in such a union, um, we, 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 see the, uh, we can see the perspective uh, of it in the future. I remember, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, I, I remember, for example, I was in October in a conference uh, taking place every two years where 4,000 Chinese entrepreneurs of the biggest yeah. and the highest caliber of, of China were in, in London, in UK, uh, in an exhibition of, you know, startups. There were a lot of, you know, interaction going place between the members. You have not many chances like this. I mean, it's not something that we see every day in Cyprus or in countries like Cyprus. So, uh, just an example of what are the opportunities of um, uh, being a member in such a network. Yeah, and of course, we signed the MOU with the Chinese entrepreneurs. As you said, there were 4,000. It was an incredible event, wasn't it? I, I mean, I, I think um, just to amplify and, and perhaps uh, add to, if you take your law business um, and you have to, uh, operate in Africa and you want links. The chairman of our, of our Nigerian board is chairman of a Pan-African independent law firm um, with, with offices in Ghana, uh, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, Uganda, Rwanda, I, I mean, I, I, and is expanding. And that, for, that, that linkage is a very good thing where you, for an organization like yours where you may have a client who's, who's got issues or is wanting to develop in, in Africa, and as you mentioned, India, where we have a very big network as well. So, uh, so actually, you've given me a thought. We should have a, a webinar for the legal, uh, our legal members and perhaps um, see how we can get you cooperating more, uh, uh, more, more together. So um, thank you for jogging my memory on that, Costas. Great. Let, let me also add the, the financial cooperation among the, the Commonwealth can enhance also the political uh, cooperation among the Commonwealth countries. So it's, a, it's another incentive for, uh, I mean, for governments or for, or for business to, uh, to enhance this cooperation. And I will totally agree with you that, um, you know, uh, Commonwealth offers, um, you know, a huge uh, a huge network uh, for any kind of business. Um, let me also uh, move to the uh, to my next question. I mean, beyond all the opportunities that we all mentioned uh, during our discussion, uh, Lord Marla, what are the main challenges uh, for the Commonwealth Enterprise and Investment Council? Well, it, it, how long have you got? Uh, the, the challenge number one is getting buy-in from governments. We, we don't have any problem getting buy-in from businesses, but we have too few Commonwealth governments participating and supporting our activity. Getting, you know, they, they agree, uh, the minister passes it down to the civil servants, the civil servants take hours to process the money comes eventually and, you know, it starts with the UK downwards. So getting them to understand that their own weaknesses uh, is not playing to the strengths of other organisations is a constant battle. Uh, the, the next challenge is uh, growing the organisation in a way that we can continue to service our members um, without you know, without um, over, over expanding, so that if we hit a crisis again, we can cope with it. 
Uh, but the, these are uh, modest challenges. The, 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 real, the real challenge is coping with the amount of activity that is coming our way at the moment. For example, I won't mention names, I've been asked to mediate, or our organization has been asked to mediate uh, on 170 million tax uh, situ uh, situation in the, in the Caribbean. Uh, we've been asked to advise a small island state on um, raising uh, finance for um, uh, you know, post-COVID finance, which we're working on at the moment. And when I say raising, of course, we're not raising the money ourselves, but we're merely putting parties together that can assist in that process. Uh, we're working on a, a green um, finance facility to support, um, under the patronage of the Prince of Wales, to support the um, small island states on greening their economies to have access to finance. A lot of the smaller island states in the Commonwealth do not have that access to finance. We, you know, the, 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 the um, development of uh, the Pacific Islands in, uh, in that they're now being overrun by Chinese investment. How does one uh, maintain uh, a semblance of balance and assist the, the, um, the, Cap the uh, Pacific Islands with, with maintaining that balance against the Chinese? Uh, just the endless amount of activity that's coming our way and demands are coming our way it, it is difficult to manage and, and you, you have to manage it um, very carefully to ensure that as a delivery based organization and that puts great demands on itself that we can continue to deliver. So uh, I, I think uh, the opportunities are extraordinary the um uh the the sky is almost the limit uh, and the limitation is really on the factor of how we can cope with the opportunities you're gonna I, I think you said to me earlier you want to come on to the covid question later so i'll, I'll i won't say any more than i've just done now and we'll deal with covid later yeah uh, mr um I would like also your view about the, the challenges um, that facing the, uh, the Council, especially from your perspective um, as a strategic partner of the Council. Um, I, I, I wouldn't uh, focus on um, the word challenges. I would, I would say that there are opportunities for further um, um, expansion and uh, maybe better communication between the members. There are There is a lot of work taking place right now, as far as I know, uh, on the use of technology, uh, which we can add to the, um, uh, let's say, agenda of the Council uh, through, for example, an app that uh, there is a team that is working on. So, uh, this would um, facilitate communication between the members and would uh, allow instant access and interaction uh, between all the members in the various countries worldwide. So uh, I, would, I would say that this is the biggest, let's say, opportunity that we have in front of us right now. The connection, the interconnection between the members through a smart uh, app, a, a, a formula, a platform, uh, which we could use for uh, getting uh, direct access uh, immediately uh, from one to another. I mean, yeah, there, are, there are always tools like emails and all this stuff, but the more, more vivid and more uh, interactive platform uh, would be ideal, especially during these times uh, where traveling is not uh, very easy, uh, we have the restrictions and all this stuff. So uh, this is something, uh, the use yeah. of uh, technology towards this, this goal that we could say that, uh, at least in my opinion, would be very important at, at, uh, at, uh, during this period. And, and, and can I just um, add to that? Um, uh, and um, 
Costas mentions this app, which we're about to launch and have been working on for several months um, as our you know, internal network app. Um, of course, we, we, this we will be launching soon. Uh, and one of the examples of things that we would put on the app is not just the networking, but as Costas knows, one of our members has, uh, is a very big polling uh, organization and have been carrying out weekly polls um, on, um, government, uh, on population reactions to government, um, to uh, priorities, etc. Uh, in five or six countries, including America, India, UK, Australia, um, where at Hong Kong, where uh, it's been a very detailed polling, which we've been able kind permission of, uh, of um, uh, Crosby Texter Associates to um, circulate exclusively to our members. And I think this is the sort of thing that would, where, where we would use our app communication uh, to do that. And as you say, to join a, uh, a, a, an app that has got influential, privileged and uh, interesting uh, opportunity associated with it is a, 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 a way forward and I'm grateful um, for that advice. Exactly. Mm -hmm. there, there is access to very advanced uh, information uh, which we are privileged to, to have through, through these uh, um, kind gestures, let's say, of members like the company mentioned by Lord Marland, where we get the instant uh, access to uh, detailed information, for example, for the COVID uh, uh, reaction throughout the world uh, to, 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 to enter in the next topic. So uh, th these uh, all will be benefiting from, from a platform that uh, is now the team is working on right now. And this will uh, escalate the rhythm of information interaction between the, the members, for sure. Very good. I think that uh, you mentioned a very good point. Uh, now let's move to the second part of our discussion in regards to COVID-19 pandemic uh, implications. Basically, so there is no doubt that the ongoing pandemic COVID-19 influence, among other things, uh, and the global uh, economy. So my first question goes to Lord Marlan. What is the impact of COVID-19 uh, in common with economic relations? Which sectors affected negatively? Or on the other hand, uh, which sectors or business found opportunities during this pandemic? And, and later, uh, Mr. Katsaros um, up and can answer the same question. Well, the, the uh, you know there are fifty three countries in the Commonwealth, many of which are small island states, which are heavily dependent upon tourism. Seventy percent of their uh, economy is tourism based, at least, and uh, this therefore has had a huge impact on the tourist industry um, and you know appalling uh, side effects of, of employment etc mainly throughout the government the commonwealth governments have uh, acted very responsibly and sensibly towards their workforce as indeed have most of the employers but of course there are always ones who haven't uh, I see, uh, you know, that there is a big surge, uh, certainly in the UK, to um, re-establish tourism. Uh, talking to travel agents um, last week, they are seeing three times the activity of the same week as last year. Not so. There's a huge amount of activity of people wanting to return to the tourist fold and one has to hope that um, the impact is uh, not knocked back by a second wave. If you take um, the cruise industry, which is absolutely mm. huge, billions of pounds, not just to the cruise industry itself, but to the economies where the ships visit, 
the impact is absolutely massive on those, the airline industries, all those sort of things, the knock-on effects. And uh, if you look at many countries, and uh, particularly in the West and, and in the UK, people are living off a, in a false dawn in that um, if you take the UK, people have been earning 80% of their salary because they've been furloughed. Uh, companies have been able to get free finance uh, from uh, interest-free finance from the government. Uh, this has kept alive one or two companies which have otherwise would have been ailing anyway. Um, and so we haven't really seen the um, fallout from this. And inevitably, uh, unless things pick up to the same levels as, they, as the equivalent of last year in the latter part of this year, then there will be a, a significant amount of redundancies, which are all st already starting to build through, and are therefore uh, unemployment. Uh, access to finance uh, has been incredibly easy. Um, and uh, in a lot of countries because of government bailouts and government printing money, the effects of government printing money on the economy uh, and how they repay that uh, is going to also add a huge potential burden on future generations. And I think it's going to be very interesting how uh, governments reposition their, themselves uh, to um, not impose too many shocks on their economy and yet repair their own national balance sheets. So uh, in some ways, the, uh, you know, the, the worst is by no means over. Uh, in some ways, the pandemic is only the start of a serious problem. How the world stops itself going into um, a global recession, how the world stops itself from having rampant inflation, which can only be really controlled by um, higher interest rates, will be very interesting to see and how, um, and, and how um, businesses fail uh, because they're unable to pay back the government lending and how the government treats that lending uh, or that government support is going to be very interesting. That's not just the UK, it's, it's virtually every economy. Um, if you take three months out of one business year over a 10 year period, it's not, it, it's, it's, it's a big shock, but it's not the end of the world. Um, uh, but if, if it happens again, um, you, you are in for serious business crises. And, um, we, you know, the world will be different because people will be more nervous about travel. They will be, um, obviously using this type of communication that we're using at the moment. Um, and uh, there will be therefore greater, there'll be a lot of costs taken out of business. There'll be greater use of um, AI because, um, there were, you know, it will be an opportunity for businesses to use AI to replace staff and therefore greater unemployment. Uh, there'll be more, there'll be less retail shopping because people will buy more online, which has grown a huge amount, obviously, that time. So, you know, the, the things that we think will, that we've been used to doing for years that one would expect to come back, in my view, won't come back. I think we will continue to take advantage of, of, of opportunities like this, of webinars rather than traveling. Um, and, uh, you know, some things will come back very quickly, but a, a lot of things won't. Mr. Katsaros, your view? Uh, I don't think there is much to add on what Lord Marlan said. Uh, I, I would say that there is also a psychological impact uh, related also to the um, um, uh, handling of the crisis uh, across the world. Uh, during the first phase of the crisis. For example, in countries where we had the immediate response by the government and uh, uh, there was the avoidance of a severe impact with uh, 
many people suffering and uh, all the effects situation uh, at least uh, was under control uh, from that perspective. For example, in Cyprus, uh, we took very early um, strict uh, decisions on a strict lockdown and this prevented um, the virus from being uh, contagious to the vast majority of the population who had a very few cases. I think that um, we, it, it remains to be seen um, what will be the, the effect during the second phase, because as Lord Marland said, uh, there are small countries uh, like Cyprus, which are depending on tourism, on tourism a lot. So uh, there are a lot of challenges uh, with regards to security, uh, when uh, we receive uh, people from abroad and all this stuff. On the other hand, uh, we cannot continue and keep up without, without uh, having this machine uh, working. Also, there are um, um, uh, challenges in the economy. For example, if one would say that Zoom that we are uh, now using would value more than uh, the seven uh, biggest airline carriers uh, uh, some years ago, they would say uh, well, uh, the, 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 the one that uh, makes this prediction is crazy. Uh, we also have to prepare, I think, at least in my opinion, that uh, we, would, we will not name crisis uh, situations like the one that we are facing right now. For example, within uh, less than 15 years, uh, we, uh, a world has uh, uh, been in front of two major crises right now. The one was the crisis of 2008 to 2012 in some years uh, with the subprime crisis, banking crisis. Now we have um, a, a pandemic crisis, both with um, severe financial impact. So uh, one major lesson that we have to learn is that we, we cannot expect crisis to be born in order to take measures. Uh, crisis will be there as people uh, I mean, we are living in a totally different planet. There are, uh, the, the population of the planet has uh, a, a tremendous growth. So people throughout the world, uh, pandemics like the one that we are having right now are easier to come. I was reading the news today for a, a G4 uh, virus connected to um, the previous virus of, uh, it's nine uh, nine. So it's it, it's 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 um, uh, we have to live in it to learn to live in a different world, and we have to structure the way that we are working and uh, the way that we are uh, facing life uh, in accordance with the the new era that is uh, already. Uh, it's not the future. It's uh, it's present and uh, it's it's ongoing situation. Thank you very much, Mr. Gatsaros. Um, Lord Marland, I mean, uh, your, your participation uh, in this episode, I think that uh, it creates for me the temptation, and I will take the opportunity uh, in order to ask you about the uh, post-Brexit era. Uh, according to your view, what is the role of Commonwealth in the post-Brexit era? Uh, is it an alternative option uh, for the British trade and business? Well, it's uh, a no-brainer for the UK government. If you have a, uh, a 53 nations, which you have long-standing historical um, trading relationships with, which still, uh, despite the UK's uh, attempt to break with them uh, when they went into the European Union, uh, exist um, uh, and can be very easily, in my view, rekindled. The problem for the UK is, uh, as I alluded to earlier with, with government itself, they think they know how to do everything and they think they're the best people to do it. So they don't necessarily understand the uh, benefits of organizations like ours, even though they're members of our organization and have commissioned work from us. But, um, you know, they're, they're, um, they 
they've been so focused on Brexit and getting there, they haven't quite worked out what the route map is post-Brexit. Um, and uh, other than, funnily enough, the Prime Minister who texts me quite regularly to say, um, can we start a Commonwealth trade deal? Which is uh, a wonderful ambition, but is going to be very difficult to achieve because clearly, even if you take Cyprus, uh, it couldn't be part of a Commonwealth trade deal because it's part of the European Union. Um, so, it, it, you know, they, 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 they kind of um, think they know what to do, but they're not there yet ready to do it. But the opportunity is fantastic. It's a third of the world's population. It's a huge market. Uh, a lot of the countries they, uh, are difficult countries to deal with, but uh, a lot are easy. So it will be, um, uh, you know, it will be, it's a great opportunity and one that they should um, use and, and hopefully will. Um, they, the, the, the focus, however, is getting uh, out of Europe and, um, you know, I'm sure we'll have some more significant conversations with the government when they've finished uh, that. We're, we are very well placed as an organisation because of our personal relationships at a senior level in the British government um, and the trust that they have with us to be quite a significant part of uh, the future for them. But um, uh, to be honest, they're only one of 53 countries as far as we're concerned. We serve the Commonwealth, not the UK. Um, and uh, I would be delighted if um, Cyprus said to us, you know, how can we further? And we will put every effort into Cyprus doing it. So they're only one of 53 countries and we're well placed as, I, as we are in many countries to support. Mr. Katsaros, would you like to comment on, on that? Oh, as uh, Lord Manland says, that uh, the, the truth is that there are so many Commonwealth countries with uh, potentials and uh, uh, dynamics uh, in, uh, in the Council uh, where we could take benefit from all the countries uh, trying to achieve some targets and uh, uh, along with their local governments to be able to uh, enhance the presence and the value of, of the network for the local economies. So I think, uh, as I said previously, Brexit can, can be seen as an opportunity uh, due to the need for an alternative path for UK, which of, of course is a major part uh, of Commonwealth. Uh, it's not the only path. Uh, if it is... Uh, uh, being handled in a way that uh, the, the UK government will uh, yeah, give um, the essence and the uh, effort that is needed in order to, to expand this network, uh, this would be, of course, on the benefit of the network. It's not the only solution for the network, but it's a very important one. I think, as very clearly Lord Marland stated, uh, the opportunities lie, lie ahead for all the countries, all the member countries of the Council, in order to be able to create uh, bonds and uh, new paths for the network's expansion and uh, uh, creating value for, for, uh, for its members. Thank you very much. Uh, dear both, uh, our episode is moving uh, to the end, so um, I can give you uh, you know, the floor uh, for your final uh, remarks, uh, comments, or a message that uh, you want to send uh, to the audience. Mr. Katsaros, would you like to, uh, to, to begin? It's a great opportunity for anyone that, want to, that wants to open new horizons in a, uh, in a really important network of a high caliber. It's an honor that we had the Lord Marland with us today. We hope to see him in Cyprus soon. Uh, situation is perfect, uh, I mean, uh, summer-wise, if you, <laughs> you uh, allow me the expression, with 37 degrees right now, so extremely hot and uh, uh, nice for holiday, expecting for British tourists, as, uh, as you mentioned. 
uh, we hope to to meet soon and the um, uh, situation improves so that we be we will be able to uh, meet uh, in person again uh, uh, through one of uh, the, the the activities that are uh, being planned for the near future instead of being uh, in a web virtual let's say uh, uh, situation it, it's better to be again uh, uh, close in person closer yeah hopefully lord, lord Marlan, your message uh well I, I think we've been through the most appalling thing that's happened in my lifetime and uh, i'm considerably older than you so hopefully it doesn't happen in, <laughs> again in your in your lifetime but uh i've never known anything like this um it's uh had terrible loss of life um and shown um what damage these things can do globally and you know our thoughts are with everybody um, who's had to suffer this um the great thing about the hu human nature it has this ability to forget and i see um, people forgetting about these last three months quite quickly and returning back to uh, to work and prosperity uh, as quickly as they can. Those that don't, of course, will be left behind and it's the left behind that will be the problem for us all. Our organisation stands ready to support uh, everybody across the Commonwealth, but in particular our membership, uh, in helping them back into action through the network we can provide. I think one of the things we haven't touched on and uh, is the role of China in the uh, near future and whether there will be a, a response against China from the Western world. If, if there is, then it'll be organizations and, and aff affiliations like the Commonwealth that will do extremely well because of their like-minded attitude. And um, I particularly want to finish by paying tribute to the Cypriot government for the way that they've handled this crisis uh, and the, their, the, 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 the attempts they've made to prevent loss of life, which has been really extraordinary and uh, congratulatory. Uh, the greatest loss to me personally was not being able to go to Cyprus uh, in April, but uh, I hugely look forward to uh, returning in autumn and um, breaking bread and maybe having a glass of that famous Cypriot wine with you uh, when- Of course, of course. So thank you very much really indeed for all done. I mean, th thank you very much. The, the RCS Cyprus, um, I mean, we're open to facilitate uh, any kind of uh, synergies, collaboration. So we're open um, doing any kind of events or collaborations with, uh, with the council. Uh, dear, dear both, let me thank you for this really, really interesting and I think productive discussion. I'm sure that um, the audience uh, will enjoy this, uh, this episode. So, uh, dear friends, thank you for watching this episode and don't forget to subscribe on our YouTube channel. See you to the next episode. Bye-bye.